The following is a presentation of the Four Center podcast feed. From the center of the galaxy, this is the Four Center podcast feed, and this particular episode is one of our deep dives. Submerge yourself in a bakted tank of soothing talk about the future of Star Wars in 2023. I'm Joseph Scrimshaw. I'm Ken Napsuck. I love looking towards the new year. I, I don't really set goals uh, and, and I don't set uh, like, you know, it's the new year. I got to change my life. But I love flipping that calendar the first month and looking ahead. And this is what we get to do today in Star Wars. I'm excited. Can you hear it? I'm excited. There's actual excitement. That's great. Yeah, I do set uh, goals. And this last year, I set concrete goals, not like, uh, you know, dream vision. I hope this happens to me. But here are things that I can complete. And I've got all of them done except for one. And I've got like two days left. And I just, what what a jerk I was to write that one down. If I'd skip that one, to have a clean slate. So yeah. excited yeah. to discuss our, our Star Wars uh, dream visions and our Star Wars goal, uh, yeah. goals, <laughs> goal. We only have one uh, <laughs> going into the future. But uh, for this episode, we are going to discuss the slate of television shows coming out. Uh, some of the books, uh, one of the video game, uh, the comic books uh, we struggle to keep up with. So, hey. We're excited about those, uh, but we won't be covering them as much because we we don't uh, we don't manage to keep up as much as we would like. Despite Ken picking up mountainous stacks of comic books every two months, right? <laughs> uh, too much, too much. We'll talk about that. Yeah, I, I looked at the the receipt on the last one. I was like, I don't know how long I can keep doing this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I finally caught up with the, like the last straggling comic books at the end of uh, High Republic Phase Two and got them all downloaded to my iPad. So I'm ready to complete that last mm-hmm. step from eight months ago anyway that's the past we're gonna move into the future by telling you that today's podcast is brought to you by audible get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash four center over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iphone android kindle or mp3 player this week we are recommending hey a book from the past that is in our future path to deceit by Tessa Gratton and Justina Ireland. It is the launching point for us of the Phase 2 High Republic Adventures, and we can't wait to dive in. If you want to dive in, you can download a free audiobook by going to audibletrial.com slash center. One more time, that's audibletrial.com slash center for a free audiobook of your choosing. And we've also got our new segment called Ask. Ken, do you want to ask? I'd love to ask. It's it's the ask segment. We're working on theme songs. Tony Taxman's busy, so we're not going to be able to do <laughs> a new one yet. Uh, yeah, we are uh, building out our YouTube channel. Some of you might be saying, finally, some of you might be saying, you have a YouTube channel? Yeah, we've actually always had one. Uh, but we've been having a lot of fun doing live Q&As, rebroadcasting podcast episodes, special content, and more is on the way. We announced a new show Figure fights coming in February to the YouTube channel, as well as some essays and a lot of other things on the way. So uh, we'd love you to join that party and uh, sign up, subscribe. We're trying to reach 7,000 subscribers on YouTube. No set time frame. We're just trying to do that. So uh, play, uh, please, if you want, we humbly ask, head over to YouTube and subscribe so we can reach our 7,000 subscriber goal. Had a nice little bump since we recorded yesterday, Ken. So it's all working. Thank you all for uh, joining us on YouTube as we build toward the future. Uh, Are you ready for our main topic, Ken? Yes. Yes, indeed. You're stripped down to your Luke Skywalker bakta diaper and ready to get in. (laughs) I'm in. I'm in. (laughs) Let's just graphically overextend this metaphor and have some fun with it. Anyway, there is a lot of Star Wars coming in 2023. Uh, It seems some of these are, we know, yes, they've been officially reported uh, by Disney+. Plus. Others are sounding like uh, what the majority of of outlets are uh, believing is going to be released in 2023 some of these not entirely confirmed by disney but this is what we're going for uh mandalorian season three ahsoka skeleton crew bad batch season two visions volume two and young jedi adventures plus more books comics video games toys a convention in london and more so obviously ken uh we are big star wars fans and we're lucky to have so much storytelling but i want to start from this point of uh, not fear and negativity, but concern, reflection, the changing times. Are you concerned about Star Wars exhaust, exhaustion from the general public? Uh, yeah, I, I absolutely say yeah, an honest yes. Um, 
I, I, I could break it down personally, but yeah, in terms of the general public, because because that's the type of thing too that I don't even know if it's true, but I definitely feel as though it could become the narrative, right? If someone thinks that and tweets that, it be, it, it starts a wildfire. Mm-hmm. And then in this conversation, well, there's too much Star Wars, too much Star Wars. I, you know, we're in an era of a lot of content choices without a doubt. And there's a lot of Star Wars content choices, but I, I mean, like I, give me one every week, right? Like, and I think a lot of people <laughs> agree with that. An episode, a new episode every week or a new piece of content every week, probably be fine. Uh, but I, yeah, I, you know, you could just, when the news coverage, the podcast, like us, everything it is just Star Wars, Star Wars, Star Wars. I, I think it could add to that. Uh, um, and so I, I hate to admit that sometimes, but yeah, I, I could see that coming. Yeah, no, I think for me, a part of the reason I wanted to address that right at the top is trying to take a step back of we get to live in this wonderful Star Wars bubble doing the podcast and having a community that listens to this podcast and lots of other podcasts and YouTube shows that are very excited about Star Wars and want to make it a big part of their time and want to give a lot to it. And then there are people who love Star Wars, but mostly see the movies and they see one or two shows. And, and, and you know, some of those people didn't like Boba Fett, didn't like Kenobi, kind of liked Andor, but man, that's too much Star Wars, particularly when, you know, a lot of, at least a couple of generations were used to Star Wars being, there's a movie every three to 16 years. <laughs> yeah. Um. So I think that is what I'm reflecting on is remembering that Um. for those of us who deeply love Star Wars, it's probably almost never too much Star Wars, but for all of the assessment that's going on with different streaming services, uh, the general public's reaction is going to help determine, you know, what comes down the pipeline. And I do think it, it isn't just about Star Wars to me. I think there's a general growing sense of franchise fatigue um, with many franchises. And, and for me, I almost feel like it's the, um, with Disney Plus in particular, Star Wars and Marvel, Paramount Plus and, and, uh, and Star Trek, um, we're on the precipice in the coming year of uh, Doctor Who being released in America on Disney Plus, and the the showrunner who is who is coming back, who helped uh, relaunch Doctor Who and is coming back, has been saying before it was announced he he was going to come back. He's like, there's no reason Doctor Who shouldn't be like Star Wars and Marvel and Star Trek. Mm-hmm. So we're probably on the precipice of suddenly there are uh, seven Doctor Who shows. <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. So I, for me, it's almost like this feeling of. Um, when you first move out and you can now eat breakfast for dinner, you can have a pizza for breakfast. You can have a beer at 10 a.m. if you yeah. want, you know, that's yeah. sort of like, you know, this doesn't have to be a once every three years. This doesn't have to be a one show. It, it could be like, here, you can have it all. And then a little bit of like, we've now gorged ourselves. And maybe it's like, is that too much? Mm-hmm. <laughs> is that mm-hmm. too much Star Wars and Marvel? It, it, so for me, it's not just Star Wars. It's this idea of, we entered a new phase of genre storytelling of franchise storytelling. And was it, is it, is it too much? And would we enjoy it if it was scaled back a little bit more, I think is a general conversation that's going on. I think star Wars for me has not been anywhere near as much uh, storytelling as say Marvel. And it's been more diversified and kind of from animation to big series Mm -hmm. events to, uh, you know, fun, weird one-off things like the Lego specials. So I, I'm kind of thinking this, we had a, we, we had a lot this year with Boba Fett, Kenobi oh. and, and, or, and then a bad batch and uh, all sorts of things. But I think, um, mm. I think the, the shows that are coming up are a good balance because I think Mandalorian season three is still going to be kind of an event show because enough of the general public was hooked on the mm. adventures of Mando and Grogu. Uh, and then I think things like Ahsoka and Skeleton Crew, I'm really fascinated to see if they sort of break out of the Star Wars bubble and become mm. something like Andor, right? Right. Because right. I feel like Boba Fett and Kenobi had like a built-in, uh, they, ha- they have fans of multiple generations, right, who are going to watch these big-name characters. Mm-hmm. But Ahsoka is a big-name character for many generations of Star Wars, but not all generations of Star Wars. Mm. So is that as big a deal as Boba Fett and Kenobi, it, you know, or is it going to be a little bit more of a bubble show or is it going to be phenomenal and everybody's going to say, you got to watch it the way yeah. everybody did with Andor. I, I think uh, I'm really interested in seeing how much it breaks through. Yeah. And it's that, that so good conversation. Cause remember, uh, you know, again, one of our favorite characters around here, but a few years ago, 
I can't remember if it was tied uh, Force Awakens or Rogue One, uh, whatever, around the time. And just like a lot of people were like, Ahsoka should be in these, like Ahsoka, Ahsoka. And I, I still ran into a lot of people were like, I don't know who that is. I think that's changed. It's continued to change. And this will help that change. Uh, but that's a big question I have. In, in, in my house, uh, I'm obviously excited. I can tell you, Grace, has, like, she's a Star Wars fan. She was so excited for Boba Fett. Loves Grogu Mando. She looks at that and is like, is that the, is that the sweater girl show? Is that the one that lady that makes the sweaters? <laughs> like, and, and she's open to be, you know, uh, educated about it and, and would love the character. She, she is actually is a fan of Rosario Dawson. So she can connect with that way, but it, it is one of those questions. And, and to the bigger picture too, of like general public and everything, like you mentioned, like the Marvel stuff, I've always, um, I'll be said, you know, I'm, I'm a casual Marvel fan. So therefore sometimes it seems like there's too much because I'm not engaged with it, where again, Star Wars, you hook up the IV, right? And and I think maybe Star Wars can find, I think they do with Bad Batch. They know their audience is a little small on that one and they're okay with that. Um, they're servicing those fans. And I think mm -hmm. that's, it's the ba balance. It's the balance. And and, and sometimes, um, yeah, sometimes like I said, when I run into someone who feels, hey, there's too much Star Wars, I, I, I don't have the desire to fight them because I, I could point to another franchise and be like, yeah, I, I agree with that too. Uh, too much of that because I'm not, I'm not craving it weekly. So I don't know. I don't know. So we're yeah. in a weird time business-wise. We are in a weird time. And I think I will never get over. I think um, uh, I've made the comparison before of like, if, if people grow up in difficult times and then, you know, they, for their entire life, they're like, you got to clip coupons or you got to save this, you mm -hmm. know, material that was scarce when I was young. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I think I grew up with that mentality about genre stuff of like, but it could go away anytime. <laughs> you don't understand. This is scarce. And like, I have to get to that mentality of like, but it's not scarce anymore. And it isn't even about desire. Mm -hmm. It is about like with Marvel for me, I've enjoyed all the shows and the movies, but it's about like literal logistics. Like I haven't rewatched, I watched Moon Knight because my wife didn't have time to watch it. And I haven't rewatched Moon Knight with her because of time, <laughs> yeah. not desire, you know, and that's just a different world to be living in. Indeed. Yeah. Indeed. So if we're in this period where uh, I think streaming services are changing up what the goal was. Uh, they mm -hmm. just, they wanted to add as many subscribers as possible. They're spending a lot of money to do it. That's the number that the companies were giving to boards and to investors to show them that everything was going great. Subscribers, right? And now we're getting to a, a place where subscriber growth is not going to be that feasible. So how are these streaming services going to measure their success? Is it going to be financial? And if it's straightforward financial, does that mean uh, that the volume of content is going to constrict a bit? So if if quantity isn't a goal, if the goal becomes, hey, with something like Star Wars, we want two event shows per year on Disney Plus, and that's it. How would you feel about that? I would feel both truly bummed, uh, but also be like, well, what a blessing that era was. <laughs> we had three or four shows. <laughs> I have the, you know, there was a, you know, my career has changed in the last couple of years. And there was a one, one point where I just kind of was like, well, 2014 to 20, uh, maybe even 2019, that was a lot of fun where I could get recognized a little bit more. I could go to conventions often for free to, as covered as press. That's not happening for me as much anymore. What a fun time that was. <laughs> I'm bummed <laughs> gun, but hey, got to experience it. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that's uh, how it is with service because you're so right. This is, you know, this is this is new technology. This is a new era. We're still, it, it's still so brand new, right? I, I remember having conversations with a friend of my, uh, mine about five, six years ago podcast and all the stuff and he's like we're what what five years in really five years in 10 maybe television's 100 years in movies are 100 years in you know what i mean like they've had time to figure out what works and what didn't work and, and mess about with things uh we're still in that let's see how this actually goes and and what you're saying in a weird way like i don't want to say scares me but like yeah i think it will start to change you already seen some of the bad things happening H hbo max and tax right on mm. shows and 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 things going and and by the way I, you know I it's, I've heard some people this didn't happen with physical media stuff try buying one of my favorite favorite TV shows Ed it doesn't exist anymore that was a two thousand show mm -hmm. this has always kind of been a problem it's just it's a new way it emerges in a new way and it's in a very much in a new way right now um so yeah I maybe it's a roundabout kind of way I, I think about this more now that the, you could see some dramatic changes and we got. We got real used to the pizza for breakfast. 
Now I might have to go to pizza once a week. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it is the possibility of looking back on this is not the salad years, but the pizza for breakfast years, right? Yeah, and, yes. and as yeah. much pizza as you want. Um, it, it, and I know for, for some people, uh, I, I want to be really respectful and mindful that, that some people like, I really want, I have room for in my life and I want this in my life. I want as much Star Wars as possible. Yeah. Um, and look over at Marvel with like uh, envy of like, come on, <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. you know, that yeah. because Star Wars has not matched uh, Marvel's uh, output. So uh, I want to be uh, mindful that there are definitely listeners who who feel that way as well. For myself, if it did constrict, I think I would be definitely be happy for this explosion time. We we're able to look back and go, Geez, we got a Boba Fett and a Kenobi show in the same year. And that wasn't even it. <laughs> right. There was a bunch more, you know, be right. walking around with a walker telling telling the kids <laughs> about the year that there were four Star Wars shows or whatever, you know. Yeah. Um, I think uh, I, so I'm torn about it. So if, if streaming in general constricts, I, I think that there might be some health to that. Um because I think not Star Wars, but mm-hmm. in general, there is a little bit of like throw things at the wall, throw things at the wall as much as possible. And and I think the word content starts to eat away at the meaning yeah. of, of what storytelling is and how it should affect us and mm-hmm. give uh, g- taking the time to let different stories sink in and, and think about them and feel them and be on that vibe. Um, so a part of me would be like if there were two Star Wars shows a year that's still incredibly rich compared to the decades of my life where there were no Star Wars shows mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and they'd be big events. Right. And, and they would get a lot of focus and we, we would really spend time with them and rewatch them and reexamine them and all that. Um, yeah. 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 Go ahead, please. I just, I just like, again, it's that thing and we can make a joke of it, but it's like, go back to, I don't know, 2008 and be like, you're going to have a television show, six parts where young Leia, you and McGregor, <laughs> Show some scope one. Hayden Christensen. Uh, there's a bunch of villains with red lightsabers. Vader. You get to see Vader get it. And that's a small part of the year. I, I, I couldn't comprehend that. So, yeah. yeah. Sometimes that kind of perspective helps. Yeah. Yeah. Kenobi and Vader fight on a stabby rock moon planet. Oh, amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so there's a part of me is like, I get it. And there would be benefits to that. But then on the other side of it, for me, I think the number of different stories that Star Wars has been able to put on, on Disney plus both animated and live action have really helped flesh out the galaxy have mm-hmm. really helped flesh out different perspectives. Um, the, the Mandalorian kind of started giving a little bit more perspective to the Tusken Raiders, but that was so enriched by spending time with them in a uh, book of Boba Fett. Everybody has loved Andor because it has given such a, a ground level perspective to both the rebellion and the, the people caught in the tyranny of the empire including the imperials themselves uh i don't feel for myself like any of the storytelling that uh star wars has done and as a side note marvel has been pumping out content for content's sake Uh, that's a popular thing to say right it's a it's a cash grab they just gotta pump out more stuff with baby yoda's face on it you know like uh, i i get that but i i don't agree with it to me these stories all have meaning and value their interesting stories that feed into the larger show or the larger story saga of star wars Mm. so i don't want to lose more perspectives more voices more styles of shows right that's the thing that that i think i find really valuable about having multiple shows multiple styles uh, a year is to have that variety of perspective from the real world but also fleshing out the star wars galaxy yeah, I, I mean, I definitely agree with that too. And, and yeah, that's, and that's what I was talking about, about that general conversation, right? Um, some, you know, dummy puts an Instagram reel out claiming Marvel's just, just slipping and, and, and boom, viral. Everyone goes, hate, hate, hate. Let's get in our cars and get angry. And that becomes the narrative. But with your friend from your old job that you haven't talked to in five years, you know, <laughs> here Marvel's just kind of barfing up content. It all sucks now. No, it doesn't. Same with Star Wars. Yeah, I, I, it's... This is a, a valuable, valuable year, 2022. So we look back. I mean, what they did with Boba Fett uh, in terms of just changing the story around him, adding new wrinkles, Kenobi going back and showing things you never thought. It, it just—I I really love your idea of, of of it just growing the galaxy at large, and that's yeah. valuable. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about some of the shows that are coming up. Um, We're going to talk about the live action shows uh, first. We've got uh, three live action shows. Uh, 
we believe, a Mandalorian, Mm -hmm. pretty confirmed. But Mandalorian, Ahsoka, Skeleton Crew are all arguably under the Mandoverse banner. Uh, Ahsoka has certainly been described that way. It is obviously Filoni uh, leading it. Filoni and Favreau obviously doing the Mandalorian. Skeleton Crew, once it was announced, different showrunner, but they... Favreau and Filoni have really been like, and here's this other part of our our world. It's in the same era. So what's exciting about that? If it is indeed, these are the three live action shows this year, and they're all under that Manoverse, Mandoverse banner. What's exciting about that for you? And what's concerning about that for you? I, I think, I don't want to start negative. I, 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 you know, first of all, if you don't love that part of the saga, we we and a lot of people refer to it as Mandoverse. Some people don't like that term, but it's it's uh, it's what we got here, and I like it. Uh, if you don't love that, you might fill out in the cold, right? Um, mm-hmm. But I'm I'm here for it. Um, you know, but I wouldn't love I wouldn't mind lo- seeing the ball spread around the field more, which makes me excited for Acu- Acolyte in a different era. Mm-hmm. Uh, but what's also also exciting, I, I do think all it's not just that connected universe thing, that connected story, that 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 actually only goes so far with me but as a star wars fan we are about to get i think some some bigger answers um we're going into some exciting storytelling with mandalorian we'll, we'll talk about i think uh and that's not we don't even know everything that's coming our way ahsoka is a character i absolutely love and to get to mm-hmm. con- con- continue the story and perhaps big uh bring some some answers i, I i'm really I'm really excited about that uh I, I just just wide open road in front of me on those, on those uh, stories. I'm also excited to with Favreau and Filoni. Now, John Watts and his team, whatever, whatever they're, they're doing playing around in this era is interesting to me. I have some, when I, when I you know, I have some hesitancy myself for just all these Mando shows uh, because there's a lot other, a lot of other things in this era, this five years after type of thing, this new Republic era that, that I would love to get to that. I just don't think, we can, you know, I'm not going to get a Mon Mothma and Leia conversation figuring out the new Republic. That That's a book. It's not a show right now. Um, you know, it's possible with technology. I, I get that, but I, I just don't expect that. I want to get a lot of those answers and I don't think Mando's going to get into that. Maybe, maybe not. We'll, we'll find out. Um, so there's, a, there's, I'm overall super excited with a little bit of like, I have to remind myself to just go with where they want to take these stories in this era. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I very much agree with you. I think the thing that I'm really excited about um, the connected storytelling to me isn't, it's not necessarily about this, this character is going to pop up here and this character, it's not like just about crossovers, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, to me, the connected storytelling is more about the era yeah. and it, it's not, uh, there, there will be crossovers with the characters, but I think to facilitate, um, telling the story of this period in galactic history. And I think if you really dive into the Mandalorian, even season one, you know, Favreau and Filoni have now, you know, publicly said the intent was always to start small, start with focusing on this one character who isn't really that deeply connected to the rest of the galaxy. In fact, it turns out he was raised in a very limited way where knowledge of the rest of the galaxy was kept from him. Uh, and then it's going to widen out as he, as he discovers a galaxy. Um, but even within that, if you look at season one, look at the number of times in the number of ways that the state of the galaxy is mentioned, right? Of how, how does bounty hunting work in the New Republic era? Uh, when do you have to worry the way X-Wings and in, in New Republic officers showing up is framed is like, they have a lot of power and you're in trouble if you're on the wrong side of them, you know? Um, but but how where, where and how have they dropped the ball? How do they not take care of somebody like a Cara Dune or why did she walk away? All that has been in there since the first season. And now I feel like by exploding out, these shows are really, this Mandoverse to me is really about this era Mm. because now we're going to be exploring it from more perspectives. We're going to be exploring it from uh, a Jedi like Ahsoka Uh, since Filoni uh, calls her a Jedi and the episode where we met her again is called the Jedi. I'm just going to go ahead and refer to her (laughs) as a Jedi. I know some people might disagree with that, uh, but I'm I'm planting my Jedi Ahsoka flag myself personally. So seeing it from a Jedi perspective, like Ahsoka Uh, veteran rebels who, who have Mm -hmm. fought many battles like Hera and Sabine, we're going to see their perspective most likely Uh, Mm -hmm. lost children, in skeleton crew growing up in a time of change, we're going to get the perspective of whoever the hell Jude law is. It's like all sorts of different perspectives on 
this new era of, well, we've restored the new republic, but have we addressed the problems of the old republic? What's it like for all these different people and factions to grow up in this time of change? Yeah, I really hope it pushes to that. I really do. That's just a hope, not an expectation. I think it's just something really interesting about this era. Uh, yeah, and you're getting me excited for, yeah, the points, points of view on this. Uh, and and yeah, and I agree with your take on Connected too. I, I rub up against the, the people's desire for connection, right? Because it seems to turn things into content versus the art, as you said earlier as well. So uh, we're, we're in the cusp of something pretty, pretty good with this Mandoverse expanding. Yeah, exactly. So I'm I'm very excited about it. I also think I just need to take a deep breath and acknowledge that there are going to be some people who are frustrated by it. I think mm-hmm. the the quality of Andor obviously uh, is you know a big part of its success, but I think also the breath of fresh air that it was a different tone, a different style of storytelling. And mm-hmm. I personally really like the sort of a mythic and minimal and sometimes cheeky storytelling style of Favreau and Filoni, but it's a very specific tone. It's a very specific uh, style and taste and I get that some people are just like I've, I've, I've been tasting that flavor for a while mm. and it, I'm curious to see what kind of different flavor John Watts and the rest of the creative team are going to bring to Skeleton Crew but I expect some people to uh, feel like um, we want more flavors at the buffet and you know yeah. I think I was a little hopeful that Acolyte came out in 2023 to add that same uh, mm-hmm. different spice that Andor did yeah, which right could be possible. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. who knows? Who knows? Yeah. And it could, you know, and it could change. They could, as we talked about uh, for far too long, they can put a billboard up on Sunset Boulevard as big as a building that uh, that skeleton crew is coming out this year, and then they'll take it down the next week and go, "Whoops, nope." Yeah. <laughs> so. Here. Yeah. yeah, it could change. It could change. Uh, we're going to dive into a few of the specific shows, uh, live action shows coming out. And we've got to do kind of a, um, a an asterisk here. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, there's some official uh, uh, official synopsis going around. Uh, if you if you Google, you know, Disney official synopsis, uh, Star Wars shows 2023, there are some uh, various uh, sites picking up uh, these official synopsis. Uh, and I was re- all excited to uh, read them and discuss them. Um, but then when I dug down, it was there was just one site reporting it um, that that this is the, the official synopsis for these shows. And some of them have been um, posted like deep on a, the D23 uh, <laughs> article yeah. from Disney itself. Others, this is the first time we're seeing them. And when I dug in a little bit, um, it's all of them is just coming from one site. And the site, you know, doesn't really reference the source. Uh, it's normally a site that we really like and really trust, but we, we try to be really mindful of if we're reporting on Force Center, this is official, but wanting a little bit more um, verification uh, that it is official and where it came from. Um, and so anyway, long story short, <laughs> we're not quite comfortable uh, sharing these synopsis as uh, official, so we're not going to read them on the podcast, but they're there for you to find and for you to determine for yourself how much you uh, trust the various sources of the various websites. Yeah, I, I, I know what you're saying, and we're trying to be respectful of all parties. It's just a weird time out there for Star Wars news and news in general. It has been for a while. You can make all your fake news jokes if you want there, but in terms of Star Wars, it's just, it's, it's, it's again, that conversation, something whispered becomes cold hard facts and that necessarily shouldn't be the case so uh we're just trying to play play it cool and and, and one of the particularly the, the synopsis going around about mando has me super intrigued so i want to make sure i'm getting excited for the right thing and not something that was uh not just about leaked but like wrong yeah <laughs> Yeah, that's, I think I just want to practice what, what we sometimes preach about uh, mm-hmm. about being careful because I saw this official synopsis, got really excited about it, wanted to talk about them. And then it's like, well, I should probably double check if it's, you know, wh- where this came from. And then mm-hmm. it was like, oh, uh, it, I can't find any verification of where it came yeah. from. So, uh, no. and mm-hmm. I'm kind of bummed because I, I wanted to, you know, like you do when you see a, a headline that's intriguing and you just want to hit re- a retweet without looking into it at all. I almost did that. Because it's enticing. Yeah. But anyway, we are going to have a fun conversation without the synopsis. We have good synopsis at home in our hearts. Uh, all right, Ken, let's start with Mandalorian Season 3. Uh, what are you excited about uh, potentially in, in this show? 
you mentioned before, and it's something I think a lot of people are talking about, this natural evolution for what came before, this small lone bounty hunter, you know, becomes a, a father tale is absolutely exploding out. It already has. Just the arrival of Bo-Katan, just the arrival of more Mandalorians in, in season two versus kind of the the cult members, uh, allegedly, we'll say, uh, that he grew up with, right? Um, that just took the story in some interesting spots. And, and, it, and the wonderful questions. And I love the questions. I think some, sometimes questions from the fandom can, can reek of a little bit of impatience, right? Like, mm-hmm. but, 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 but in Rebels season four, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to get those answers. I think just the trailer, just seeing the changes, just seeing those uh, Kowaki and monkey lizards now thriving. <laughs> in captivity. It's just a great way to look at the show to see the size of grief Karga's robes now versus where he was in the beginning. It's just an indication of where the show's going and that great shot in the trailer of, of, uh, you know, going to uh, Mandalore seeing the capital destroyed and everything just, just gets me excited for, for all that stuff we keep talking about the bigger picture and, and whether it's go straight into the new Republic stuff. I don't know. Okay. I'll, I'll keep out my hope. That's what's, what's really intriguing for me. Uh, Cause you know, that's why I yell about Carson Tev is the only one who's seen what's going on. That's why I get excited about that to plug it in. I can't accept that Leia hasn't looked at a report that says someone named Moff Gideon's flying around. Like I, I, I'm looking forward to that, those big, bigger connections, but just, moving Din and Grogu into uh, their, I don't want to say true purpose, but the bigger, the bigger just field in front of them of storytelling. Uh, I'm just excited to see that play out a little bit more epic. Yeah, you're getting me excited not only for Mandalorian season three, but like Mandalorian season four, which is to <laughs> me like, will they join the New Republic? <laughs> right, right. Uh, once they reform as a culture, which I think is where this is ultimately uh, heading. Yeah. Big, big picture, in my yeah. opinion. I love that you uh, point out the quacking monkey lizards and the, mm-hmm. the changes. We, we've seen, you know, Navarro grow and grow, right? And become more yeah. prosperous and, and healthy. Uh, but I love the idea of... <laughs> We used to be food. Now we're public nuisance in a tree. (laughs) (laughs) Harassing people. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I think for myself, there's, uh, I'm just excited to go back to that style and tone. I know some people have had uh, their fill of it and and understandable, but I really like the the style of storytelling, the mythic, the minimal, Mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that it's coming with a bigger budget and fun surprises. I love Din, Din Djarin as the guy who's just wandering through the galaxy, you know, mm-hmm. trying to pass his coursework on star Wars one oh one, And when he has the basic information, the truth start to make, you know, changes in opinions for himself. And, mm-hmm. and I think that's probably what I'm most interested in is Din's continuing journey to define what Mandalorian means for himself. Mm-hmm. Um, with, with Bo-Katan sitting on that throne, that sort of like a uh, leader in exile uh, versus the armor saying, no, I'm the leader in exile, mm-hmm. you know, and knowing that Mandalorian, that Din is going to be caught between them, wielding this symbol of what it means to be Mandalorian. And mm-hmm. I don't think, I think Din is probably conflicted. I think he feels, mm-hmm. you know, horrible guilt that he took his, his helmet off from the perspective of the armor. Yeah. But from from the perspective of Grogu, do you think he regrets it? Do you think he regrets making that connection with his son? Mm. Mm. No. I I don't think so. Right? Right? (laughs) So he's like, I didn't do anything wrong, Mm -hmm. but the person who gives me all my validation about my identity, the armor, thinks I did. So even though I know it was right, I will go on this impossible quest uh, to get her approval again so she can tell me I'm a Mandalorian. You know? How Mm. can that not lead to him starting to make these stumbling attempts uh, attempts to define Mandalorian for himself. Um, So, and then I think a really interesting thing is what is Grogu's conflict, right? Um, Because in these first two seasons, it's, there's definitely been this like, uh, what is Grogu picking up about how the galaxy works by his dad, you know, punching and flame throwing his way (laughs) through every moment of his life. Right. And then he goes and he trains with Luke a little bit and he gets a little bit more perspective. He remembers his past training. Hmm. He gets a little bit of balance. He sees this scene of carnage and chaos and he sees the truth that that rancor is a, is a scared, you know, child hmm. who needs to be soothed. So I'm kind of wondering if uh, Mandalorian season three might flip the script a little bit where Din's journey 
his mission is for himself, about himself. It's not for Grogu this time. It's not protecting him or delivering him to his people. So is is Grogu's you know role going to be helping guide Din toward more balance and, and more self knowledge? You know, on like an emotional level, is Grogu the key to Din learning to wield the dark saber? Uh, I absolutely love that, and and the the reason I don't know how to say I, I I'm such a fan of Grogu, right? I'm curious to see more. Um, and I don't know if this is a hot take, but I like that we're past the stuff with him and Luke, which I enjoyed in Book of Boba Fett. It's part of the larger picture, thematically connects. I'm glad we're past that. I'm glad they're back. And I'm glad they're in the N1 flying around having more adventures because I want to get to the next phase. And I think what you're, what you're, you're setting out, again, we'll see what happens. We're open to what mm-hmm. happens. But I'm excited for that part of the Din thing. It's not that I'm not engaged or, or care about Grogu. I clearly do. But I almost think like, cool, we, we went through a lot with Grogu and it was a lot about him. <laughs> what is it about Din? Uh, and, and, and I'm excited for what you're saying because one of the, one of my favorite moments of that of that trailer, I, I'm, I'm being vague and, and, and paraphrasing, but like you got Katie Sackhoff sitting there as Bo-Katan just kind of on that throne going, where the bleep were you? Mm-hmm. That's one of the best lines for me because it's not about who was right and who was wrong in terms of what a Mandalorian is, is right. Is we're just, we're getting some real nitty gritty personal stuff with those two and what they went through and what Bo-Katan has gone through and the changes she's gone through and the losses she's experienced. She has a right to her strong opinions, has a right to ask that question of where were you when Mandalore fell? And he has a right to, to be like, well, I'm defining some things for myself, um, but I'm here now. Let's figure this out. Like, I, I'm excited about those, you know, interpersonal office drama in, 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 in the Corporation Mandalore. <laughs> yeah, rewatching the the Bo-Katan episodes uh, in Rebels got me really excited uh, yeah. to spend more time with her and, and to see the journey that that character has been on from from being in, in the Death Watch and, and horrifically violent, being all yeah. in on might makes right. And we have a right to just come into a, a village and, and make these people our servants because we have power. And that gives us the right, mm-hmm. that old school Mandalorian way to seeing what that does to Mandalore, seeing what that does to her sister. And, and I had forgot that uh, there's that scene where, where Sabine is, is tempted to manipulate the horrible weapon that she built to just slaughter every Imperial within miles, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. Bo-Katan's the one who's like, no, nah, that's not going to get you what you want. That's going to, you know, that mm-hmm. that's their mindset and that's not going to be how we win and then goes through then Bo-Katan goes through all the horror of the Empire cracking down on Mandalore and where she, where exactly is she at now yeah <laughs> on this long journey that she's been on about the use of power the use of violence you know how yeah. you fight fascinating yeah. stuff in her backstory yeah yeah a lot of things that might make her think well I don't agree with that but it, it worked to some level how do I combine these things is that even right and what do I do going forward yeah 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 and what should Mandalore be and mm-hmm. yeah and, and hate, like she resists just being handed the dark saber but she takes it and, and I don't think that's not a that's not a uh canon gaff that's a mm-hmm. that's a rich storytelling possibility that yeah. she just she just took it uh, because she didn't think everything had to be about violence and then everything fell apart and now she's not willing to have that sword again unless she beats down whoever has it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, we don't want to turn this entirely into Mando Season 3 Center because we'll have lots of uh, opportunities to talk about it. So we're going to move on to Ahsoka. What are you excited about uh, for the Ahsoka show? I, <laughs> I wish they called it the Ahsoka show. The Ahsoka. And then we would think it was a variety show. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, sounds like a variety show. Um I'm excited for some deeper emotional content. Well, of course I am. But here's the thing. Ahsoka and Sabine in particular, uh, they have a, a, a lot to work through, um, both maybe together as friends, individuals. And in the past, when those characters have had to deal with big emotional trials and tribulations, it's been some of my favorite Star Wars storytelling. Mm-hmm. Just having those two characters around, just having Dave and his team telling those those stories. Think of the Ahsoka stuff. Think of the Sabine stuff. The Trials of the Dark Saber episodes I already liked them, but I remember going back and kind of rewatching them a couple of years ago to pull some notes from them. And like, like Tia Sakar, and I know she's, she's not uh, behind Sabine right now. And uh, Natasha Lou Bordezou is um, just that, the, the character on, on her knees, crying in pain, just working through all the emotional trauma. I just remember thinking like, I, I knew this was here, but I forgot how much of an impact it had and how much of an, just, I, don't, I guess adult story, but like just realistic 
gritty emotional story and all the stuff with Ahsoka and, and, and just where, where we meet her in, in Mando, somber, sad, where we meet her a little bit more peaceful and serene and maybe having a purpose in Boba Fett and where that all will fall on the, uh, on the chart for these two characters. I, I just really want to start with there uh, with, those, with those two characters and see where it goes. Yeah, me too. I, I think I'm really excited for the Ahsoka show. Not that I don't think there will be a uh, plenty of uh, darkness and conflict, but I feel mm-hmm. like the the characters are poised to go on a journey of healing and reunion. Right? Um, yeah. Yeah. When you when you look at what's what's happening uh, for the characters, and you know some rumored stuff mm-hmm. that I don't think is entirely fully officially confirmed. So mm-hmm. you know, take it with it, whatever amount of salt you want to, but. Um, it, it absolutely appears that this is the journey to find Ezra, which means reconnection for mm-hmm. uh, Sabine and Hera and Chopper, you know, healing and reunion. What has Ezra been through uh, wherever he's been? You know, has it been through has he been through something quite dark? You know, mm-hmm. uh, what kind of healing uh, does he need? And then, you know, Ahsoka, what with being the title character of the Ahsoka show, um, I really feel like we are going to meet her at a point of that where she might still be wrestling with Anakin's fall. Uh, I think if the, I don't think the Hayden Christensen is in Ahsoka stuff is 100% confirmed, but Mm -hmm. assuming that it is right. uh, The possibility of Ahsoka literally communing with the spirit of Anakin Skywalker, that's healing and reunion, you know? Mm -hmm. So I am really excited for the emotional story and then, you know, live action Thrawn, if that, I mean, that seems quite likely what with the whole tease of, you know, where is Grand Admiral Thrawn? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm i very excited to see the, the hear the soft whispers of <laughs> <laughs> that scary blue man and, and, and playing the game of how do you make Thrawn as absolutely brilliant and knowledgeable and calculating as he is and still find a way for your heroes to triumph. That that's a yeah. really fun and interesting challenge, and in the way they handled it in Rebels is there were there were you know pieces of the chessboard that he couldn't see because they were of the Force, they were of nature, they were deeper than what uh, degree are your cannon set at? You know, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I always it's funny you almost forget the potential of Hayden, right, or or, or Thrawn. There's just there's a lot rumored and a lot that we just expect because of the the, the characters already on board but yeah, i'm i'm really excited about that there's just a bunch of wide open real estate in that uh unknown region area in the sequel era and i'm not suggesting that we're going to run into the first order snoke sith cultists other chiss i don't know there's just you know yeah you, but yeah it could be but like I, I think i have to temper my expectations but um yeah it, it's a wide open range of storytelling there in that era yeah, absolutely. And and very excited for the possibilities, which leads us to the show that we know the least about. And that is Skeleton Crew. What are you excited about in, in the small amount of information uh, in the one weird picture of Jude Law we've gotten for Skeleton yeah. Crew? It, yeah, yeah, it, it's that. It, it's excited. Uh, I'm excited because I just don't know what, what the hell this is. Uh, you know, I, I got the idea. <laughs> Uh, I, I like that it's potentially skewed younger. I think that's always valuable, um, you know, and I'm, you know, yes, we got adult stuff for Andor, if that's what you believe. But I, I'm just saying it, it, it's in this little corner of the, the Mandoverse, if we want to call it that. Like, I, I like that we got something that might uh, have that young perspective that, like you said earlier, like seeing the change of the galaxy through a generation that might be carrying the burden of some of those decisions later on. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's interesting to me whether or not it goes that deep. Yeah, it could. I think it could be coming of age. I, I, I trust John Watts on that one and his team. But um, And not for nothing, but, you know, Drew Law's a pretty talented performer and a known enough name that I'm, I'm excited to see what he can do in Star Wars uh, and what that will uh, what that will bring. Because it's, it's, it's slightly different than some of the – I'm trying to run through some of the TV show stuff just in terms of cast. There's a lot of great cast. A lot mm-hmm. of them are uh, either emerging stars. A lot of them are, you know, big stars. I, I would call Pedro Pascal a, a big big enough star, just Game of Thrones and beyond. But, you know, I mean, like Nick Nolte coming in or something like that. It, it's like, it's 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 a different flavor than Jude Law, like one of one of the respected movie actors of our time coming to Star Wars to lead a group of kids through the galaxy. I don't know what to expect from that. And that's kind of exciting. Yeah, I mean, I think Ewan McGregor is a monster star, right? Um, but yeah. that's him returning to a role. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, a show just just being led by a decades-long 
you know, full on movie star like Jude Law is, is fun and, and interesting. And I think also because we don't know anything more about the character and most of the promotion is just like, it's got Jude Law. <laughs> Here's a picture of his face with some yeah. vaguely yeah. space fantasy stuff near him, uh, you know, makes it really entertaining to yeah. think about the Jude Law of it all. But it seems like the kids are the focus. I think for me, you know, that, that's been described as that sort of a uh, Spielbergian coming of age, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, so I'm really excited for the perspectives of the kids. What, what uh, are the, you know, do they come from different perspectives or do they all come from the same perspective? I wonder if, if there's a possibility, and I'm trying to speculate responsibly, mm. if in this era, the New Republic's solid, if you're, in the core, right? If you're at mm-hmm. Coruscant and Chandrilla, you know, and kind of in there, you that that's a that the government is settled. Uh, there's no question of who's in charge. The laws are the laws, and if you break them, some X wings and some prison yeah. robots are coming. That's coming for you, you know. Mm-hmm. And you can lead a little bit of a known life, right? But mm-hmm. there are parts of the galaxy that the New Republic hasn't managed to uh, get to yet, or parts of the galaxy are mm-hmm. saying. Our system is going to take care of itself. We don't want to join your damn republic, right? Yeah. They're not going to be forced to, like the Empire. Uh, and you go you go there, and it's whatever laws that system has, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, I'd be intrigued if it's uh, kids from the core who end up going out into the scary, <laughs> the quote-unquote <laughs> scary parts of the galaxy and yeah. have to push past that fear and that terror and then, you know, discover joys by pushing past that fear and seeing the galaxy in a new light and seeing, you know, uh, the diversity mm-hmm. of uh, of the galaxy, galaxy in, in many different definitions of that word. That could be really yeah. interesting to me. Uh, yeah, right here with you on that. I, I can't wait for a little bit more information. But at the same time, you had mentioned earlier this week on our, one of our shows of just sometimes you were Star Wars could be in a. Uh, uh, unmarked brown bag, which is open at the table we get on the day the show comes out. This could be one of the things uh, that I uh, w- wouldn't wouldn't have a problem with. Uh, it just shows up. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I don't know if the show will go here. This is uh, not responsible speculation. This is it's not even speculating. It's just saying, wouldn't that be cool? I'd be really intrigued if at least one of the kids was force sensitive because I think that'd be another mm-hmm. way to look at this era of. What's that like in this era where the the Jedi are not entirely reformed? They certainly don't have like a press team you know, mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. going out there and, and they don't have, you know, a, a home base. Their home base is just starting on Ossus, but it, that's much more of a spiritual thing than like, you want a business meeting with the Jedi? Go to the temple on Coruscant, you know, like, yes, they're not as established, but if you're developing force powers in this era, four or five, whatever years it is after, uh, the Galactic Civil War, it's not an immediate death sentence, right? Yeah. yeah. It's allowed, so to speak. Yeah. It's allowed, but is it understood? What do you do with it? How do different cultures feel about it? You know, right. that would be really interesting to me. Agree with you on that. Yeah. Uh, that, that'd that be, I don't want to say, I definitely don't want to say it's almost a given, but it just seems like that would be in play. Yeah. It seems like it'd be weird yeah. to not have the force during this era uh, evolved for the show like that with, with the youth in the future. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, let's please fall in love with another character and then wonder uh, how they escape Kylo Ren. <laughs> <laughs> the shadow that eggs over all <laughs> the great Star Wars tradition. I love this character. How do they die? We're, we're going to one day we're going to just have a show where there's like another, it's another galaxy over as a planet. And they're all just sitting there going, Hey, we're good here. <laughs> no. King Grogu says we're fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's it. Grogu opens a a, a resort uh for yeah. for force users who just don't wanna. <laughs> anyway. And Jason Sandula teaches yoga on the <laughs> weekends. Yeah. Uh the Mortis Resort. That's what it is. Uh, Soka <laughs> opens a resort there at Mortis. That's the one. That's the one. <laughs> uh season eight of the White Lotus will be set in Mortis. You heard it here first. Uh, We're going to take a quick break and we'll be back to talk about more Star Wars coming in 2023. 
And we are back as we look at all the Star Wars storytelling that will be coming in 2023. Talked a little bit about the live action shows. Now let's talk about some of the animated shows, Ken. Uh, there looks like there's going to be a pretty wide variety. Uh, Bad Batch is continuing the big galactic stories and featuring returning characters. Then Visions Volume 2 is all new canon adjacent stories from different cultures and young jedi adventures is high republic adventures for preschoolers so uh you know quite young what to you is the value in that variety in terms of like the style of storytelling and the goals of the different animated shows and simply put a bigger table more guests at the star wars table right and mm. these shows definitely uh, do that. I think the books and comics kind of get to that there uh, as well. We can talk about that more, but I, I, I think that's where I start with it. Uh, again, we talked er, earlier about you know, Bad Batch season two, as as with season one. It, I, I do think it's a little bit of a narrow focus sure, show. Like, did you love the Clone Wars? Did you grow up with the Clone Wars? Do you appreciate the animated side? Not everyone does. We've discussed that a few times, and they're they're okay with that. You get you just get the sense that they're okay with that. Uh, so that that focuses on those people. The, the visions focuses on another group of fans, and, and I, th- I think there's a, a definite crossover. Then we'll get the Young Jedi Adventures uh, in a bit here, but yeah, that's where I go. Uh, it just it it just expands the reach on a more uh, micro focused uh, method and way. Yeah, no, I I agree. I feel like in some ways, Bad Batch is narrow focused because I guess for audience, yes, because it's animated yeah. side and it's you know it is basically a Clone Wars uh, uh spinoff. But at the same time, Bad Batch to me kind of represents the core Star Wars storytelling right now. That it is, it's not quite an anthology show, but it has shown its willingness to be like these two episodes are about this character because uh, it's telling the story of of this era of the immediate Imperial takeover um and you know no uh, appearances by other characters i'm not going to use the the c word cameo no <laughs> valuable storytelling appearances of other characters are off the table in bad batch uh so i feel like to me it's kind of the the core star wars storytelling it's the story of specific characters in a specific era in in and how that era is informed by what has happened in the past and how it's building toward the future and then these two other animated shows kind of celebrate these different parts of Star Wars to me. Like the the whole idea of Visions, both volume one, but now here with volume two covering, uh, you know, bringing in stories from all sorts of different places and cultures mm-hmm. and not worrying at all about canon, right? These are, it's just a celebration of the mood, the style, the themes of Star Wars. It's basically walking around the globe and saying, what do you think is cool about Star Wars? Cool. Yeah. Put it in a, in a animated short. Um, so to me, it's, it's nothing but just like the basics of Star Wars. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then it, it sounds like young Jedi adventures is, uh, is designed to be, you know, what Lucas always talked about is, is teaching lessons, you know, uh, mm-hmm. clone Wars started with the morals, uh, young Jedi adventures. If it's aimed at preschoolers, yeah, I think it's going to be Jedi Sesame Street, right? It's just going to be like, what are what are the core lessons of Star Wars? The core lessons uh, of the Jedi. I think it's going to be a kind of a, a hashtag justice for the Jedi show. Yeah, <laughs> but it's breaking out this other part of Star Wars of you know, if Visions maybe celebrates you know some of the themes and the lessons certainly, but also just the mood and the style and what does the lightsaber look like if this is style mm-hmm. of storytelling, all that kind of thing. Uh, that is one side of star Wars, but then for the, have the young Jedi adventures go like, these are lessons you are meant to learn for them. It is meant to be didactic. That's Mm -hmm. an interesting focus. Uh, yeah. And one of the reasons I'm excited for it too. Uh, and like I said, uh, just bringing, uh, bringing these new eyes to the, to the franchise. We talked earlier this week. I'm not here to defend the franchise. It doesn't need that, but I'm here to defend all the new fans that want to get into star Wars and all the ways they get into it. And, and, And these, these projects do it, do that. Yeah, no, and preschoolers, that's definitely going to be, that's the reaching out to uh, to young kids to, to bring them on board. Uh, so let's talk a little bit uh, about uh, the shows uh, specifically. We've been doing a decent amount of Bad Batch talking, so we're going to uh, focus on the other two shows. Uh, we'll go to Visions Volume 2. What are you excited about for Visions Volume 2? Uh, I, be, being honest here, I'm excited for other people's excitement. Uh, you, you touched on <laughs> what I love about uh, visions volume one and and will um, undoubtedly love about volume two going around the world and saying you like star wars what does it mean to you mm-hmm. uh, express it in your way uh and that's a it's a good like 
Star Wars character study, like if, if Star Wars itself is the character and you're studying the influence, the legacy and, and how it is viewed through uh, different cultures and perspectives, that is tremendously valuable. And I enjoyed that. And I enjoyed a lot of uh, what was there. I, I, I just can't lie and say I was completely invested in it. I, I was looking at it in a different way. I engaged it with it in a different way. Uh, and I, you know, I always say the can someone who, for someone like me who doesn't, doesn't get hung up on canon you know, on that micro level mm-hmm. where, I, you know, Soka's blades were green here, we're clear, whatever. Like, I, I, I don't care. <laughs> like, I'll, I'll go on those rants. I don't care. But on a macro level, I, I do, I can't lie and say that, it, it, you know, it uh, does affect me a little bit where I just kind of view it as to borrow sports uh, kind of a view on it. It's like an exhibition game. I'm like, this doesn't count in the standings. I'm going to watch it and I'll wait for the, I'll wait for the next thing. And that's just kind of my honest, cynical view on it, I suppose. But uh, I, I'm excited to see what they've got coming for us, especially around the world. I'm ex- excited to dive into the themes explored through different perspectives. And again, there's so many people excited about it. I was at my mailbox center today and the girl working was like, I got this uh, new book. It's called Ronin. It's Star Wars Visions. And I was like, oh, yeah, I heard of it. And, and she was so excited to dive in and, and see it. I, and I feed off that excitement. Yeah, I, well, that was a, a really good sports analogy that I actually understood and related to. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you. I think that there is an investment for me in the, as you uh, came up with the great phrase of the emotional canon. Yeah, if a, if, a, if a story ends up being a little bit different, but the spirit of it is the same, Cobb Vanth basically went through the same thing emotionally. It has the same meaning, mm-hmm. um, but the details are different. I, I don't get... Um, too bothered by that uh but but i am invested in the the meaning of Cobb vanth of this was a nasty time for tatooine where everyone is going to try to take advantage of just the citizens trying to get by what's the journey of somebody who who decides to just you know show up and make a difference and you know what does it mean that this armor uh is what allows him to do that like that that's the emotional canon story right and right, and right. Th- visions could have tell a story that is exactly that. And I would enjoy it and I would get the themes, but yeah, it, it, it is a slightly different thing to me when like, but it's Boba Fett's armor and Boba Fett means this and Boba Fett continues this. And this story continues that way. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I like a connected galaxy. (laughs) Uh, I guess that's what it comes down to. And it has nothing to do with like, uh, I don't like visions. It's not canon. It should be not at all. In fact, I love that it is. Let's just let's just not even worry about it. Just yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> just totally. put put canon away. That word doesn't even exist. Doesn't matter. Enjoy. Mm-hmm. I think what I en- enjoyed about visions, a couple of it is things is just the like. There's that level of Star Wars where lightsabers are cool. The Force is cool. Uh, spaceships are cool, and and they have meaning, and they can have different meaning. And let's just play around with those that that mood, that vibe, though. Mm-hmm the different ideas that it could represent, you know? Yeah. Uh, I love the idea that, you know, for a a Jedi who can't be a Jedi anymore, but turns their lightsaber into a microphone, they're still spreading joy. And that's what they're still fighting for the light side that like, that's a great idea, you know? Um, But I don't, I haven't, I haven't rewatched a ton of visions, even though I absolutely love uh, some of those, those episodes. I haven't rewatched it a ton. Mm -hmm. Um, So honestly, I'm, I'm just excited for more. I think the thing that I'm, most interested in is you know we talked a lot when when the first volume of visions came out that star wars you know itself was very clearly inspired by a a ton of japanese storytelling which Mm -hmm. made volume one of visions this fascinating full circle right yeah um and star wars has definitely borrowed from many other cultures uh so how does that manifest in Italian stories and South African stories and all these different places that the stories are coming from? I think it's just going to be this fascinating, like what's universal in star Wars and what is different in star Wars and, and what can we learn about different cultures of approach to star Wars and, and what is similar about us and that's to be celebrated and what is different about us. And that's to be celebrated. The idea that this one volume of, of shorts could uh, help us reflect on similarities and differences between cultures is really cool to me. Yeah. It's funny. Even just looking at the list uh, and you're so right. We, we know some of the influences, of, you know, all of the influences on, on George and do hope and, and stuff that continues to manifest, uh, you know, think of some of the, the, the Ahsoka uh, Mando season two, it's, you know, Filoni really showing his cards on the influences. And I love that stuff, but I was just looking at the list here and I'm like, 
you know, we, we always celebrate entry points in terms of, hey, what was your first Star Wars show or movie? And that's fun to celebrate and get those perspectives. But I'm looking at South Africa. I've never thought about that. What's someone in, of, of just like, what? how do they take in Star Wars? Just a, a, mm-hmm. a, as a culture, as, as a different part of the world. Like I, I, I can, I, I, on the surface, intellectually, I get it, but just uh, that's something that's really intriguing to me. Ireland, you know, and, and, and a land with... Uh, a rich history and their own way of, uh, you know, looking at the world, no way of communicating about the world. Like, of course, it makes sense. And I just have never thought of all that in terms of Star Wars. Um, yeah. And it's yeah. interesting to me. Yeah. It's very interesting, too, because Visions also, you know, uh, it, it was such a celebration of Japanese storytelling and anime mm-hmm. in, in, in specific. And anime has become so popular uh, across the world that I'm not even that uh, well versed in anime. And I could still be like, oh, this one's in this style of anime. This one's yeah. in this style of uh, of anime. So it's fun to think of like, I have no idea what the style of animation is going to be for, right. for these things and how different they'll be from one another. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. I'm all in for no canon, just vibes. That's yeah. what I want from Visions Volume 2. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, let's move on to the very young Jedi adventures. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm curious if you're excited. I'm curious if you're going to, if you want to religiously watch every episode of Young Jedi Adventures because preschoolers is, that's quite young. <laughs> um, so what do you think as an adult that you will, you will get out of something that they're being, being very clear is for preschoolers, very young? Yeah. Yeah, look, damn straight, I'm going to watch it. Absolutely, I'm going to watch it. Uh, I, I'm intrigued by it. Uh, everything you said earlier about why and the lessons, that's so great. And I think the value of it to me is that, you know, stripped of, away of all the finery, you see what's really at the core of Star Wars. And I think sometimes we need to see it like that and be reminded of that and, and know that, that going into it, this literally is not for me. <laughs> it's not for me. But it's Star Wars. And I don't even have kids. And my my uh, my nephew's 18 now. My niece is 10. This isn't even for them. It's not for them. But just to see, uh, it will make me proud to be a Star Wars fan. And I'm proud to be a Star Wars fan in this era. That uh, the journey continues. And there's now more people coming on board. Uh, these little ones that get to sit uh, here with it and see it as, as Star Wars uh, should be. These lessons that you and I talked about the big, uh, what is Star Wars? Fantasy, sci-fi, mythology. Uh, and, and we love the mythology side of it and think that um, means a lot. So, yeah, that that's where I'm, I'm going to see it. And, I'm, you know, and I guess I'm not going to go in my car and do a review on it. We'll, we'll probably address it here on Force Center. I don't even think we need to pull out the deep tapes. The, the, today's theme is sharing. Like, that's all <laughs> we need to do. And, and I'm excited. And like I said, Proud of it. Proud that this is uh, Star Wars is so big that this kind of stuff's kind of needed. Star Wars Kids YouTube channel is kind of needed. Yeah. I'm hearing Jennifer's take, takes on that. And, and uh, we're not watching Rise of Skywalker in our house. We're watching the Ton Ton Adventure Hour. Like, that is so <laughs> awesome to me. Yeah. No, I love that. And I think knowing that that is what it is going to be, the, the, this lesson is, you know, don't yell at people and hurt your your friend's feelings. Like, yeah, right. on one, uh, one hand, it's like, yeah, I got it. And like, um, but based on the, the conduct of a lot of adults, do we got it? Do we? Or, do we? Or, or should we maybe uh, listen to the basics again? You know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you have a big sandwich. Could you share a part <laughs> of your sandwich with your Rodian friend? You probably could. Um, no, uh, mine. All right, little chief. <laughs> you got to share. Yeah. So I'm very excited for that. Um, and, and a reminder that these are these kind of just basic cultural ideas of, of what is, what is the light side? What is, what is being a good person? What is the sharing and kindness? What are the values of those things? And those are the core fundamentals of the Jedi. And Hey, then, then it's a complicated galaxy. And sometimes it gets hard to find your way to, I know I want to be kind and I want to share uh, but this person's hurting this person and I got to use a lightsaber. And like you get to those complicated things that I don't think there's going to be young Jedi adventure. Like one episode is how to share a sandwich. And the next episode is you might need to cut that guy. Head off. <laughs> but you know, I don't, I don't think we're going to get to that, but no, no, we could get a remix of the, uh, uh, the Filoni George Lucas story that he actually put in tales of Jedi, where a little preschooler Jedi puts a lightsaber <laughs> on the table. and says, This is how I negotiate. No, we could get to that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and I, I like what you said too. Of just yeah, you look at the look at this landscape out there outside of the Star Wars world, social media, whatever. Just 
down the street, your neighbors, your friends, whatever. It's like sometimes you want to be like, do you, do you get it? Do you get it? Do you get the basics of how to just be a decent person? Maybe yeah. here's a reminder. Would 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 Grover be ashamed of you? Yeah, well, <laughs> yes. we grew up with the Sesame Street. I, you know, I I hope it is Sesame Street. I hope there's an episode where Yoda sings that uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten song, but the numbers are all out of order. Why is that? That's so hilarious. I just did my own pay, private Patreon podcast this week. I sang that song. Is that that's the most? That, is that the most powerful, influential song in history? <laughs> I, I think if, if you're the right age, it is just bored into your soul. And there was a bit, it went around as a tweet, somebody like uh, sharing, mm-hmm. you know, the vocalist who actually did it and, and you know, the power of it for, for yeah. those of us who are the right age. Yeah. That's yeah. So funny. Yeah. yeah. We need that for Star Wars. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, and I'm hoping for a young Tara Sanube. I will, uh, I will tune in for a young Tara Sanube. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And then we, we shouldn't, uh, you know, forget to mention this is high republic on Mm -hmm. on screen right even uh even if it is designed to be a show for preschoolers teaching real basics of of kindness and teamwork and all those kind of things uh that this is still high republic aesthetics and vibes on screen celebrating the jedi when they were at their height when they were Mm -hmm. being able to uh back up we were able to uh walk uh, talk the walk and walk the talk yeah yeah, uh, I, I I think it's a perfect era. Uh, just uh, removed from all the, well, what does the Empire think? Where is Sheev, right? I made the joke, but where is, yeah, we don't need to worry about that. Now we get a whole new characters, whole new set of times. And yeah, hopefully Yoda and young Terra Sanube. Ah, that's perfect. That's perfect for this. Yeah, yeah. And who knows? I don't know if it's all happening in the Jedi Temple. Uh, who knows? Maybe, maybe maybe there'll be some scary episodes where they wander into Sith Caverns. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. uh, moving on then to some of the, the publishing side of things. Uh, phase two of the High Republic is continuing uh, with the script for the audio adventure uh, coming out of Battle of Jedha. And the books, uh, Cataclysm, Quest for Planet X, and Path of Vengeance, plus several uh, different collections and reference books. How are you feeling about the the ongoing adventures of the High Republic as we go into 2023? Uh, I, how am I feeling? That's a great question. I'm excited to dive into it, uh, but it's telling that I, I haven't. And that's nothing to do with High Republic. It's nothing to do with the amount of publishing. I want it all to keep going. I, uh, this is where I've reached a little bit of my overload. Um, and I have to be honest with that. And I'm not pulling out of it. I don't want books and comics to pull off at all. I don't want High Republic to pull off because they mean so much to people. They're, they're doing some of the uh, best work in terms of just diversity of thought, representation of people. I, it's just it's amazing what they're doing. And, and, and to see the High Republic connect with people. Um, and it has me again, Light of the Jedi, my favorite Star Wars book. I, can I say o- overall? I think so. I think I'm, I'm trying to run through even back in the old days. Yeah, I, I, Light of the Jedi was an experience for me that I'll never mm-hmm. forget. So I'm excited to keep going. This is the part where you and I, we keep joking about Padawan. It wasn't the book. It's just like so much going on. I, I'm I'm feeling slightly overwhelmed. That's, that's my honest answer of mm-hmm. just phase two. Yeah, I think that's the thing is um, I, I'm getting to a point with some of the Star Wars books where I'm having a hard time structuring my life where they can be, where I can multitask them, right? Where like, we're doing all our other Star Wars coverage. We're doing our, um, you know, other other adventures in life. And then, you know, I used to be like, and then I make, you know, an hour of time to read before bed, or maybe that's what I do for lunch. And like, I'm having such a hard time kind of just making reading part of my multitasking of the day. And it's almost like I'm going to take a week <laughs> and read three Star Wars books in a row, and it's going to be my focus. That's what I'm doing today, period. Um, so I think for me, I, I am really excited for the content and need to kind of look at the best way. Uh, hey, there, I said content. I'm excited for the storytelling um, and, and need to find the best way to build it into my life. Um, I know that two to three of the uh, High Republic books, I can't even keep track. I think all three of them, the first wave of phase two is out. Um, and I'm so excited to kind of uh, have have a mixed experience, right, of... Uh, phase one introduced us to this general era, but now we're jumping back in time and some characters will be around. But in some ways I get to relive the excitement of phase one of High Republic of meeting all these new characters. And that's daunting, but also like remember how fun it was to meet all these new characters. And I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and look at it, it. We we've referenced uh, here as a Star Wars podcast. There's this, this uh, it's an extra work angle to it, but yeah, I, I think you and I are in the same boat. We're even just, um, Outside of that, I just where life is for a lot of us, it's a bummer. I'm not saying this because like I'm happy and putting some of these books on the shelf and waiting for them. Um, 
I like, I have to, we have the high Republic spoiler discussion on our discord. I have to avoid it. It's a bummer. Like I want to join in with our, our uh, four center friends and, and talk, but uh, it's just kind of re- the reality of it there. But uh, I'm excited, man. I excited for going back. I'm excited for uh, Yoda being more, a little bit more front and center. It's, it's a cool time. Yeah, in the frontier vibes. Uh, I know a lot of people have already uh, dived in and, and dove in and read all these books, but I'm excited for those frontier vibes. Uh, moving on to uh, other announced novels, uh, we've got Jedi colon Battle Scars, continuing the story of Cal Kestis, and we also have Delilah Dawson's Inquisitor colon Rise of the Red Blade. Uh, what's exciting about those two? I think what's exciting for me is to take this this video game, we'll talk about it in, in a second here, but to take the video game, take the characters, and really explain where they fit into the Star Wars saga at this time, on this timeline. Uh, understand how, understand the why of it, you know, having played the first game. But just it just will feel even more natural to have these characters on the landscape, which at times, like, for me, this is a big personal thing. Like, I forget Cal Kestis is also a Jedi out and about, right? Mm-hmm. Um, other people don't because they love the game. Uh, probably more than me. That's fair. But like, I'm so I'm excited to see the characters go into other areas of Star Wars storytelling, which means we'll get the bigger picture. That That's kind of exciting for me. Yeah, no, I'm, I, I like the title Battle Scars. I like the idea that they, you know, um, trying to be spoiler light about the, the first uh, Jedi Fallen Order video game, that there was sort of a decision to be like, we're just going to kind of bounce about the galaxy and, mm-hmm. you know, without uh, being constantly chased and murdered by the Sith, we're going to try to just help. Can we kind of be Jedi light in this era yeah, yeah. Uh, and feel like if, if Battle Scars is, is dealing with uh, how's that going? <laughs> yeah, how's that How's that going for you? And it, that seems like what the trailer for uh, for Jedi Survivor is kind of like Cal Kestis is out there making noise and maybe there's an idea that that's not a good idea. So I don't know if the, the book is going to kind of deal with the squad that we ended the video game with separating. I'm also excited for the possibility of some quality Marin time in book form. Yeah. Yeah. To get inside, get inside the head. Of the yeah. Story. And speaking of getting inside heads, are you excited for uh, Delilah Dawson's Inquisitor book? Oh, absolutely. The same thing with just not taking it even just beyond the video game, but the Inquisitor, Inquisitors itself. I, I've had just such a weird, wonderful journey with the Inquisitors where, I, you know, the Grand Inquisitor shows up and I kind of was like, well, of course, because you can't get Vader. He's too busy. So you need to substitute villain. And from that kind of cynical spot, it's grown to something where it makes sense that the Emperor had this. Makes sense that Vader is involved with them, and it, and it makes uh, it's for intriguing storyline when a lot of them have a lot of things going on in their soul. Uh, and 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 Fallen Order uh, had had that, and then uh, with, with sister uh, second sister, and then uh, Riva. I, I absolutely stand by that story and enjoy that story. Uh, so just learning more about it, uh, learning about who they are, why 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 they are there, and why some are staying and some might not be staying. It it is fascinating. I mean, again, to lay it down on that map and just say where does this all fit in? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm so with you, and I think it is um, at least partially our generation, right? We we grew up so much with Vader hunted down yes. and helped the Emperor hunt down and destroy the Jedi Knights. And then we get to Revenge of the Sith, and like, okay, well, there's some clones involved in well, and then Vader's on cleanup duty. And then, you know, I forgot that that's the first scene of Rebels, is Vader in the Grand Inquisitor saying, hey, Je- Jedi can't be allowed to survive. They go get them. And I definitely had that resistance of like, I, I get it. You don't want Vader to appear in, in every episode. And if he did, you know, he'd just, <laughs> he'd just slot. Hey kids, uh, did you like Ezra? Well, Vader got him. Um, I, I got that practical point, but I also had that resistance of like, oh, so, so great. So Vader has some middle management. Is that what we're doing here? All right. Yeah, yeah. Um, now going back and watching rebels, uh, uh, being relieved of all of that and now being really intrigued by the Inquisitor's story of so many of them are Jedi tortured into uh, Mm -hmm. giving up their past ways, working out their own personal vengeance uh, Mm -hmm. against the concept of, of what a Jedi is. Um, Seen so many different stories where they are uh, taught to compete for Vader's favor in different awful Mm -hmm. ways. Uh, I've just really become a fan of the Inquisitors and the storytelling possibilities. And I think what's so intriguing to me about this book is we've gone on uh, journeys with Inquisitors in animation, now live action with Riva, a ton in Vader comic books, uh, in the video game, in in Jedi Fallen Order. We we go kind of deep into some Inquisitor-based trauma. 
But to go into Inquisitor trauma in a novel where yeah. you can really go into the character's head, and this is a, a weird thing to be excited for, but Delilah Dawson writes trauma <laughs> really well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she writes literal torture, literal pain, and the recovery from it in a really visceral, effective way. And I have to guess that that's a part of a, of a journey uh, of an Inquisitor where, where we get the story from the Inquisitor's perspective. Mm -hmm. I'm really excited to, to dive into that story in, in the in-depth format of a novel. Yeah, and I've uh, just Delilah Dawson has a, a has a lot of just a lot of faith for me. Like I just mm -hmm. uh, I'll follow her, uh, especially that first experience with Phasma, where <laughs> halfway through I'm like, I, "What is this book?" And then it became something pretty special to me as a reader. So, uh, right there with with, with you on that uh, going inside them, the minds on the page there. Yep. Yep. So uh, moving on then from uh, the publishing to the video games, are your thumbs? your schedule, and your soul ready for the video game Jedi Survivor? I am. I am. I really am. I, I've sometimes taken some shots, mostly to tease Alex Damon about Fallen Order. Uh, we, we've shared our thoughts on on the the slaying of, of animals, and that seems to have been addressed, at least in the trailer, right? Uh -huh. All those kind of things I've talked about. It, it, it doesn't matter. I'm so excited to see it. I'm so excited to see the advancements in the gameplay, right? Video game technology just leaps ahead of itself so 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 fast right like excited to see where we're at with it and what's not to, to love about trying to explore a new story and even if some of them don't connect with me like oh, star wars squadrons was, was a very interesting story i wasn't good at the game i know you struggle with the game as well uh and so therefore i kind of made me move past the game but i loved a lot of the storytelling there i love the race load and hair over there so what can this game do for me what can i do if going around the galaxy uh, during this time, what's not to 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 enjoy about that? What's not to gain? So I'm excited. Yeah, I mean, I I I think it's the maps that annoyed me the most uh, mm -hmm. because I like the I, I like the free range and kind of being a little bit of railroaded in the environments where it feels cool that you jump from this level to that level on you know the, the back of a beast or mm -hmm. fly on a thing, but then you don't know how to get back to that tree in Kashyyyk. Uh, mm -hmm. That's just a, a personal video game taste. In yeah. terms of the constant. Uh, now decades long, how do you make lightsaber play interesting? How do you make force powers, you know, mm -hmm. balanced so you can't just do anything, but you can have the actual fantasy, the actual power uh, wish fulfillment, you know? Yeah. I thought they did a great job with the controls and the, the trailer for uh, Jedi Survivor seems like, and we're going to have even more cool combos you can put together. Uh, yeah. cool ways you can use the force and use lightsabers. Uh, I love that part of the game. That's a big draw uh, for me. So I'm really excited for that. I love that part of it. I love the story, the maps yeah, got mm -hmm. on my nerves a little bit. Um, yeah. 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 So, so for me, um, I, I just, it, it, <laughs> I, I've fallen off the, the, the gaming wagon. You know, I, I haven't been playing many video games. I don't even have a, a PlayStation Five. I, I don't. I, I don't. I need to play this game. I don't know how I'm going to make it happen, Ken. <laughs> well, you have to start your search for the PlayStation Five now. <laughs> uh, I got very fortunate and got what in a few days after announcing my intentions. That is not always the case. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I know. I know. I'm with you. I'm with you. But uh, I, once I push through the PlayStation Five wall, it's, it's uh, again. It's it's. I got to say. The load times. I, I feel like such an impatient modern era person. Like, I go back <laughs> into my living room and play my pay, PlayStation 4, and I'm screaming at it. Load Fortnite already! I need to play! And like, <laughs> so I'm excited to see what that Star Wars game on that uh, console will be like. Just uh, talk some video games. Yeah, I'm very excited for, for the game, for the story of the game. Mm -hmm. You know, hopefully I can... Uh, find the, the time and the money to track down a PS5. But this might be the first time that we do a Force Center review. You've played the game and like uh, I, I watch some, you know, a uh, 14 year old play it on Twitch at double speed. <laughs> might be the way. We'll see. We'll see. Might be the way. Yep. Uh, next question. What new or uh, not not new? That's what I want to ask. Uh, there, there's always so much coming out uh, in Star Wars that we want to keep up with. Uh, but there's also stuff in the past that we either missed or want mm -hmm. to revisit. So what not new Star Wars storytelling are you hoping to read, reread, or rewatch in 2023? Yeah. Indeed, yeah. Uh, you know, 
we talked about the Clone Wars report, which will be coming back for season seven. Looked at the mall comic, and, and we mentioned even in our Discord, a lot of people saying we'd love to have you all review Dark Disciple. I would love to go back mm. and to that book. That is actually, I'd say, first on my list because I read it, I loved it, had a chance to interview Christy Golden at the old Collider job, and Ooh. thought she was great. And man, you know what? I've I've just kind of forgotten so much about it. <laughs> like uh, it's it's so long ago, and also my. The way I take in Star Wars, as I've talked about before, has, has changed and in some ways changed dramatically from even back then. So I was looking for different things in a lot of those books. A lot of more, a lot more, not necessarily Dark Disciple, but a lot more clues, right? Uh, mm. A lot more, well, what does this mean for episode eight? Like a lot, a lot more of that stuff, which uh, definitely, you know, was a little bit of folly, uh, you know, though it was fun. So I just want to review that one and, and go into that story and, and and take it in again. It's so rich. There's so many things. And it's so of that Clone Wars era. And I think Clone Wars Report doing that and, and going on to those episodes on a micro level has helped me there. So I'll put that one there. And in the same vein, because it's it's been a few years now. Uh, but Leia, Princess of Alderaan, still one mm. of my favorite books. I remember a lot of those details, uh, but I want to revisit that, especially after the Kenobi series and mm. with Leia and, and Breha and Bale and uh, a lot of stuff there. And I just want to, you know, it's easy to go back and rewatch episode three of a, of a of season two of something or go watch a movie for the 50th time. And all the details are in my head. I, the details of the books are not in my head. And yes, you can go through Wikipedia and read excellent summaries. But I just want to kind of take the time and experience again and go, aha, or ooh. And uh, uh, we'll see if I can. We'll see if I can. It's on my list. Yeah, no, it's it, it's a lot to, to make time for. But this year, the, some of the stuff that I've revisited uh, or checked out for the first time, like reading that uh, Kenobi uh, Legends novel was great. I enjoyed that experience so much. Uh, obviously, listeners know I kind of uh, can't shut up about my Rebels rewatch and how mm. uh, rewarding that was. So that makes me want to continue to make time, not just for the new stuff, but for the stuff that I that I want to revisit or, or experience uh, for the first time. And for me, yeah, a Dark Disciple is so high up there. Uh, I I fear our review of Dark mm-hmm. Disciple. If we discussed it as a Clone Wars report, there's a possibility that episode will will have to be broken into four parts. <laughs> uh, there, it it is so rich with central ideas and characters of the Clone Wars era. The fact that mm, spoiler warning for people who haven't read it, it starts basically with the Jedi Council deciding. It's one thing to defeat, to find and to defeat Dooku in combat uh, because he is waging war and we are there to defend the people. It's an entirely different thing to assign someone to find him and assassinate him. We are not assassins. And the Jedi Council is sitting there debating Mm. the difference between taking down Dooku in a battle where they're defending other people versus picking Who's going to sneak into his castle at night and cut his damn head off? That's yeah. you will. You and I can talk about that for two hours, and that's just the beginning of the book, right? Then we get into the romance between Quinlan Voss, um, yeah. Ventress's journey, uh, the appearance of uh, Boba Fett's team of bounty hunters. Uh, the, it mm-hmm. could go on and on. It's so rich. Uh, I can't great. even wait. That's right, Dengar. Right? Isn't Dengar in there? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. I believe so. Uh, yeah. Quality time on Dathomir, man. Yeah, 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 indeed. Yeah, um, but then outside of uh, Dark Disciple, um, I got, uh, it, when when they started re, re-releasing Legends novels in that essential set, uh, they sent us a few, and one of them is this novel. I always hear people talk great about the Shatterpoint novel with Mace Wind, mm. and you know, I'm I'm enjoying uh, slowly catching up on some of the legend stuff. I don't I will I will never be a legends expert or an EU expert, right. but that one's Mace has been staring at me for months. <laughs> there you go. So I really want to make time for Shatterpoint. And then there's the stuff from when I was young uh, that I just I wasn't the right age for, and uh, I've now collected two of those 1970s Han Solo. Uh, books mm. and I really really want to read those with an adult uh, perspective because I think I tried once in my teens and I was just like yeah but no lightsabers mm-hmm. no force I mean I like Han but what's this and I, it, I'm it i in such a different place and now they're not just Star Wars adventures they are historical documents <laughs> about some of the earliest uh, non-movie Star Wars storytelling 
All that Hans Solo stuff's great. I saw, I saw you share the the pictures of those books. It makes me think maybe I, I also should include some of those early Lando novels that I've always talked about getting at my local library in Royal Grande and being kind of terrified and wondering where it's Luke and Chewie and all those characters I'd met before. So maybe it's time I revisit those as well as the historical document. Did, did the actual contents of the book scare you? Like the books were too scary? It wasn't. No, not necessarily that. I get, yeah, it, it, it was like, it was so confusing. I was, again... You know what? Seven, eight. I just watched Return of the Jedi. Loved Lando. I've always been a Lando fan. This and, and then like, oh great, more Star Wars with Lando. And what is going on? And it's this exotic <laughs> location. I didn't know any of it. And, and I, I was, I was just terrified in a way. Uh, uh, yeah, no, no jump scares, but just like, did I walk into a alternate dimension? And I didn't even know what that meant. So yeah, yeah. I loved it. Maybe it's time to revisit those. Yeah, I think that's what I'm so fascinated about. Is this sort of uh, we talk a lot about kind of all the different ideas of Star Wars that are baked into even the first film from the Jedi to the uh, the Republic and the political to the the scoundrels and to see these early books are like we're just focusing on the rough and tumble scoundrels a little bit almost more like Andor like of a little bit more down to earth how do you get through a day yeah, yeah. as a scoundrel where where do you get your money what kind of sandwiches do you like <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm really excited to to dive into that mm -hmm. uh, which leads us to our final question, uh, we have talked about a lot of storytelling that is coming for Star Wars in 2023, and we still didn't even cover uh, like the comic books and a lot of the reference books and even more coming than we talked about this episode, which leads me to this question, Ken. Which Star Wars character do you think watches and reads the most hollows per year? And, and is it definitely not Han Solo? It's definitely not Han Solo, even though I, I have a, a connection with... Han in so many ways. I think that's one of the difference. I love reading things, watching things. Though I, not like narrative TV, like, right, I get grumpy about that. So maybe that's where I connect with Han, where I'm like, ah, <laughs> I'd rather fly my ship around than watch the hollow stories. Uh, so no, definitely not Han. My, my answer is, I gosh, I, it might be yours as well, but I, I, I actually go to Beaumont Ken. Mm. Um, and, and a side of me that I like, and I, you know, you, you've all heard me out there, like, I, I, I've listened to a new, watch a new rock doc and it becomes my personality for three weeks, like 1971 on Apple or the, the Eagle story, like uh, whatever, you know, these, these wall could, walls could sing and, and I just get obsessed with them. And I, I, I can see Beaumont can be in that. Like I saw this great doc oh, on the Nile. Oh my God. I didn't know this exists. And just like, all right, Beaumont, we get it. We get it. Beaumont is definitely uh, a Star Wars historian and seems like maybe a Star Wars nerd. I'm sure uh, that, you know, whatever the Star Wars version of websites where you record your opinion on everything you watch, that he has mm. lengthy posts on, you know, hollowreviews.com. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. Yeah, I think Beaumont Ken is a great answer, probably the most uh, accurate possible answer. For some reason in my head, I went with the counterintuitive. I went with a character who's just always growling about being on the hunt and then realizing, but what does that character do in their downtime? And I went with Bosk. I think Bosk growls and hisses and snarls a big game. And then when he's done, you know, being shown up by Boba Fett, <laughs> yeah, he sulks yeah. back to his room and he watches his stories. I'm sorry, his yeah. stories. Yeah, Star. that's beautiful. That's beautiful. I love that. So I'm looking forward to watching some Star Wars hollows this year and imagining I'm watching them with Bosk and Beaumont. Ken, any final thoughts from you, Ken? Uh, no, a lot, Cohen. As always, it's been the case for the uh, last few years, and that's a great thing. So I uh, can't wait to celebrate it all with all of you out there in Force Center Land. Let's do it. Me too. Very excited for all the storytelling in 2023. Ken, where can people find us? Hey, you can find us on Twitter at Force Center Pod. We're on uh, Hive Social at Force Center. Facebook page is Force Center Podcast. As we mentioned before, we are on YouTube. If you'd like to consider subscribing, we'd love that. We're on Instagram as well. Podcast is available on a lot of spots. Just search or find us places like Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and more. Merch available at tpublic.com slash user slash Force Center. Patreon.com slash Force Center is where you can support us directly. You can follow me at Ken Napsock. Across a lot of social media platforms, so go to my website, KenNapsock.com. New things coming, a show called The Blathering on my podcast feed, more Saturday Night Napsock, and Pop Rock and Radio as well. It's all there on the website, though, 
for one-stop shopping. Uh, Joseph, where can they find and follow you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love the idea of one-stop shopping. Uh, mm-hmm. You can uh, find me on pretty much all the social media, Instagram, TikTok, uh, still Twitter, uh, Mastodon, Hive. My handle at all the places is uh, Joseph Scrimshaw. I think that's my handle on Mastodon, but I bet people can find me. Uh, you can also check out my YouTube page. Uh, just search for Joseph Scrimshaw on YouTube. Lots more stuff coming in the new year. But that is it for now for myself, for Ken, for Beaumont, Ken, and Bosk fighting on the internet about their favorite hollows of the year. This has been Four Center. Four Center.